water quality session with a new group of folks who might not be familiar with our work. Um, as Lauren said, I am with the Water Research Foundation, and since I don't know that uh, most of you know us, I will not hopefully bore you, but I will spend one slide to explain who we are just so you know where we're coming from and why we're funding the research uh, that we are on hexavalent chromium. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background, cover the regulatory status both in the U.S. and California for chromium right now. Since I'm at PitCon, I'll give you a little uh, information about the analytical methods uh, before I go into the occurrence that's been obtained with those, uh, some information on treatment, how to remove chromium, and then finish up with uh, the information we think we still need um, to, to regulate this compound if indeed it's deemed it needs to be regulated. So I agree with Andy, there is a lot of talk about hexavalent chromium, and by the end of this you'll be able to hopefully talk about it as well. So the Water Research Foundation is a nonprofit organization. We are member supported or subscriber supported. Uh, we used to be associated with the American Water Works Association, if any of you are familiar with them. So we were known um, by the acronym AWARF. Uh, it's still used a lot for our publications. We have, the uh, reason I mentioned the word subscribers is that we have drinking water utilities mostly, some uh, wastewater utilities that subscribe to us, and so uh, they help us sponsor the research. Um, our mission is to advance the science of drinking water. Uh, we're moving into advancing the science of water in general, um, just because those lines are being blurred between wastewater and drinking water. And the way we do that is we sponsor research that hopefully uh, helps water utilities, helps public health agencies, um, and other professionals provide safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water. Um, we do have a focus on practical solutions to challenges, so we're um, getting away a little bit from some of the more academic research and really trying to, to focus on some applied research. We've been around since the 60s, that was when we were uh, AWARF, and we've funded over a thousand projects to date, uh, all of which can be found on our website at waterrf.org if you want in more information about anything that I talk about today. Okay, so uh, hexavalent chromium is just one form of chromium. It's the one that gets all of the attention, but uh, trivalent chromium is an essential nutrient. Um, and to date, officially anyway, hexavalent chromium is only classified as a human carcinogen via inhalation, uh, not by ingestion. And that's due to increased lung cancer rates in workers with occupational exposure to hex chrome. Um, you're all chemists in this room, so I'm sure you know that you can oxidize chrome 3 to chrome 6 or reduce chrome 6 to chrome 3, and that'll come into play later when we talk about treatment. Um, it is, chromium is not just due to industrial sources, as uh, many would have you believe. It is the 21st most abundant element in the Earth's crust, uh, and so it, I mention that often and people say, well, then how does it get into water? It's mostly due to natural weathering of chromium containing minerals, um, but it, it is also from anthropogenic sources and those are the ones that make the headlines in um, movies like Aaron Brockovich. Um, so a little bit of a timeline here. Back in 98, carcinogenicity by ingestion was not determined by EPA. Um, when they reviewed it, and that was due to the body's ability to reduce chrome 6 to chrome 3 in the digestive tract. We have uh, low pH, so we, we, we reduce the uh, chromium. Um, in the year 2000, Aaron Brockovich came out. I'm sure it's a movie you're all familiar with, and that really did a lot to increase the public awareness of hexavalent chromium uh, in the town of Hinckley, and I'm sure um, I could say lots more about that, but I'll try and stick to the science here. Um, but this movie did result in a bill being passed in California that required their Department of Health Services, now Department of Public Health, to adopt a hexavalent chromium maximum contaminant level, or MCL. Uh, they, you'll hear they have not quite done that yet. Um, in fact, they're being sued because they, uh, according to this bill, should have done it many years ago. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of debate in terms of health effects and that has resulted in a lot of the delay as well as the need for more information to determine whether or not it really would be of um, benefit to regulate the compound in terms of public health and cost. 
Uh, in 2008, the National Toxicology Program study uh, did determine carcinogenicity via ingestion in rats and mice. Um, however, there's still debate about these health effects because of very high doses that were used to do this study, um, and they you know, went to extrapolate the information down, but uh, due to questions regarding the mode of action and the body's ability to reduce uh, hex chrome, not really sure you can draw that straight line. The body has uh, some capacity to reduce it, so there might be a threshold above which you can't, but below uh, which you can reduce it. So work is ongoing, um, uh, it, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that here shortly. Um, in terms of the regulatory world right now, as Andy mentioned, uh, technically hexavalent chromium is regulated. It's regulated as part of total chromium, which again is chrome 3 and chrome 6, at an MCL of 100 parts per billion. Uh, it's been regulated since 1991 when that reg was promulgated and it's measured at the uh, entry point to the distribution system for compliance. Um, however, there are, the EPA is required to regularly review uh, standards, and when they did a six-year review in March of 2010, uh, they concluded that revision to the drinking water standard was not appropriate until a uh, health effect assessment was completed. But, you know, they needed to take a look at it, especially with what was going on in California. Um, in later that year, the, a draft toxicological review for hex chrome was released, and it was based on peer-reviewed literature, uh, a lot of which contained the, or focused rather, on that NTP study that I mentioned before. Um, however, when the expert panel was convened to review that uh, uh, draft toxicological review, they recommended that new research be considered that was not yet in the peer-reviewed literature but had been presented and was showing um, some questions about the uh, NTP study that was done. Now, the unfortunate part of this is that the work is funded by the American Chemistry Council, so I'm not sure how many of you watch PBS, but um, last week there was a, a segment on NewsHour about uh, scientific integrity and some people are questioning uh, research that's funded by the ACC. The reality, however, is that we all know EPA is not getting more money these days and organizations like mine can't afford to fund uh, the high cost health effects research. Um, but it is interesting that this uh, work being done by uh, Tox Strategies as the group is showing that there is that capacity to reduce chromium up to a certain point and that the mode of action may not be the same as what the NTP study uh, stated and so that, that does affect how you then do your risk assessment process. Uh, this research is coming out in publication now, so EPA anticipates that this revised draft will be released in 2013. And I realize that's a lot of health effects talk for an analytical method group, but it, um, or an analyst group, but it, it really is sort of at the core of this whole hex chrome issue right now when you have people like Aaron Brockovich making comments that why are we so late and we know this compound is toxic and we're serving it to millions of people in the U.S. Uh, we do want to make sure that if we spend the money, which I'll talk to you at the end about how much it can cost to treat hexavalent chromium, that we do in fact get the benefit um, uh, for that, to justify that cost. Um, also in terms of, of the, what's going on at the federal level, uh, Andy just mentioned to you that UCMR3 is collecting both hex chrome and total chrome uh, data, and this data collection will be done in 2015. So once we have the uh, draft, or excuse me, the risk assessment part done, and then we have the, the data done, uh, then we can start talking about doing uh, a new, or evaluating whether indeed a U.S. regulation is needed. Now, California is a very different story. One, every state has the ability to regulate uh, compounds at a lower level than the U.S. does, and California typically chooses to do so. Um, their total chromium MCL is 50 parts per billion instead of 100, like in the U.S. And uh, in July of 2011, their Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assessment published a public health goal of 0 0.02 micrograms per liter, or 20 parts per trillion. And now they based this on the NTP study and it came out before the results of the, uh, this talk strategies work. 
Um, nevertheless, once it's set, that sets the wheels in motion in terms of California's Department of Public Health's timeline to come out with a maximum contaminant level. Uh, so uh, CDPH has been gathering information on treatment technologies and costs to perform the cost-benefit analysis necessary to determine what uh, draft MCL they're going to come out with. So uh, they have the occurrence data. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the, the costs aren't just treatment costs, but they are, include costs of monitoring and uh, residuals disposal, which you'll hear later uh, is an issue, and then the population affected. Um, so once they came out with that draft, or excuse me, the public health goal, July of 2011, CDPH had two years to come out with a draft MCL. So we expect there to be a draft MCL in July of this year. Um, we actually do not expect it to be near that public health goal due to the uh, lack of treatment technologies that can get down that low and the uh, cost of treatment. So likely we will still have environmental groups that are upset <laughs> uh, even after this draft MCL comes out. Um, so I promised I'd give you a little bit of information about analysis since I uh, think I know the audience here, but you all know much more about this uh, than I, or at least about these methods probably than I do, so I'll be brief. Um, there are a number of methods that are approved for monitoring under the Safe Drinking Water Act for total chromium. These are listed here. Uh, they use the technologies uh, ICPES, ICPMS, and GFAA and AA. Uh, as you can see, the uh, MDLs for these are um, not near the public health goal, but again, we're talking about total chrome, not hexavalent chromium. Uh, but the lowest of them is this EPA method 200.8 that can achieve uh, 80 uh, parts per trillion. And I do want to give credit to Lori McNeil, Utah State University. She's a researcher who, does, uh, who did a project for us on uh, evaluating the analytical methods and sort of trying to see how it did in different water quality matrices, and so she provided these few slides. I should have said I'm a research manager at the Water Research Foundation, so I get the benefit of managing projects that other people uh, conduct. So on the one hand, I get this great view of how it all comes together, and on the other hand, I don't get to do research myself anymore. So um, some of the details, if you have questions at the end, I may end up having to uh, check with our researchers. Um, there are some issues with the total chromium uh, analysis. First, you have to preserve the sample, and you do that uh, by uh, lowering the pH to less than 2. You do not want to filter the sample because there can be uh, chromium sorbed to uh, iron. Uh, and if the, uh, you don't have to do digestion if turbidity is less than 1 NTU, um, but there, there are some issues there that uh, digestion can help with. Um, so one, how do you recover fixed or sorbed chromium that I just mentioned uh, can happen? And then you get this interference with uh, argon and carbon, which if you look at the uh, molecular weight of those two combined is the same as chromium. Um, one way you can try and deal with this is with a collision uh, cell, but that is not approved. So we look at digestion as an option. And whoop. Okay, I didn't realize I still had my animation on this. So this is just explaining that indeed that chromium mass is uh, 52 there. Um, and because the argon is used, that's how you can get that argon com carbon uh, mass. Okay, sorry, I, think I meant to eliminate this slide. Um, but again, if you can digest the sample, you will remove this positive interference. In other words, um, you, uh, a digested sample is going to probably show you a greater result than the undigested sample. And here's a graph of some samples that Lori McNeil did where she was looking at uh, paired samples of digested and undigested samples. And you can see indeed that although in some cases it's a, a slight uh, positive bias, there are some where it really made quite a difference. And if we zoom in to that uh, lower uh, part of the graph there, you can see again that there's a slight uh, positive bias there. So uh, we do have other work that's looking into the digestion issue and how it might uh, impact the results of some of the treatment work that we've been doing to see if indeed we are getting the removal we thought we were getting. So in terms of hexavalent chromium analysis, there are a number of methods that 
uh, exist. Um, these are presented here. The latest of these is the EPA 218.7, and this is the one that uh, Andy uh, was referring to because it's being used for UCMR3. It has the lowest uh, detection limit. Uh, Lori and Andy participated in a round robin with EPA to uh, determine the MRL, and that's how these numbers uh, down here, the 0.012 to 0.036 was determined, but again, the uh, MRL that's being used for UCMR3 is at the higher end of that range. And just as a point of reference, so if you remember, the, uh, it, these are way, way lower than the MCL, but very close to that public health goal. So we're not going to get information um, below that uh, public health goal. Okay, so and here's just a little bit more detail about EPA method 218.7. It's an IC method with post-column colorimetric analysis. Uh, you start by adjusting the pH and then you're separating using an anion exchange column and anion exchange is also something that uh, works for treatment. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then it forms this pink colored complex and you detect that with a UV vis detector. And again, that's how you get that MRL of, of 0.02 or as Andy said, 0.03 ppb. Here's just a picture of the uh, setup, at least in Lori's lab. Um, but the main challenge here is that you want to make sure that whatever native chrome 6 was in your sample stays uh, chrome 6. But then again, you don't want to oxidize any chrome 3 to get um, an inaccurate result as well because that speciation does matter. Um, so you've got a couple bu buffer choices um, and you, you buffer to keep the pH above 8. Um, and you, you use ammonia in many cases to combine with chlorine to form chloramine, which is less likely to oxidize chrome-3 uh, than chlorine is. And Lori did some uh, analysis with these different buffers because um, in the, at the time, what was the, the most information we had at the lowest level throughout the nation, which was an Old Water Research Foundation project that we called the National chromium and boron occurrence survey, we used a different buffer. And then the California Department of Public Health uh, had a borate buffer. So we wanted to compare how all of these uh, worked because a lot of the existing information was collected with these different uh, buffers. So um, here's just a brief overview of how these uh, different buffers worked in waters that had chlorine, waters that had uh, natural organic matter, and waters that had a nitrifier. And as you'll see, the borate buffer really did not um, work well in any of those uh, circumstances. Um, but the ammonia was the only one to work well across the board. So we should be in good shape for the EPA method. And when I say it worked, basically that just means that it held the chrome-6 concentration for 14 days uh, at four degrees Celsius. Okay, so what do we know about chromium occurrence uh, using some of these methods that I've talked to you about? Uh, well, California has a, probably the best data set at low levels. Um, in their raw water, they've got about a third of their sources that are greater than one microgram per liter, and about 5% of their sources that are greater than 10 micrograms per liter. Um, that U.S. Uh, survey that I talked to you about, National Chromium and Boron Occurrence Survey that we did and was published in 2004, showed throughout the U.S. the raw water, again raw water, on average was a little above one microgram per liter and we'll know much more after the UCMR3 data comes in because really the, the full extent of low level occurrence outside California is just unknown until we get that information. And it should be recognized that uh, not only did the uh, data that has come in that we have at, on our hands at this time, not only was it done with different buffers and whatnot, but it just had, they had many different minimum reporting levels. So we've done a few occurrence analyses by comparing existing data, and it's just very difficult to get a sense of, of what we're looking at at these low levels in the U.S. Um, this, that's why my map for the U.S. is showing total chromium. We have a much better handle of that since we have been uh, monitoring. This particular data set is from uh, the six-year review round two data set and we're looking at 75th percentile total cr chromium concentrations of any samples or any systems rather that had more than two samples. So you can see the black dots here represent uh, where we have greater than 20 micrograms per liter total chrome. Uh, the red dots are where we have 10 to 20 micrograms per liter. 
and the green is uh, 5 to 10. Uh, since the total chromium method is, is just not as good as the uh, hexavalent chromium, we don't have information below that. But you can see here that um, there are some black dots that are scattered uh, in places other than California. You know, there's a few here, oh, a good many concentrated in Indiana and, and some along the East Coast. Now, most of the time, if you're talking about surface water, it's going to be trivalent chromium. Um, and most of the time, if you're talking about groundwater, it's going to be hexavalent chromium. Um, and again, we'll get better feel for that later. But there is a chance, and we're want to do more research on this, that given that uh, drinking water systems chlorinate before water goes into the distribution system, there, it is possible that we are oxidizing some of the trivalent chromium from our surface water systems into hexavalent chromium right when we send it out into the water. We, um, initial research shows that it's probably low levels, but if we find out that we need to be concerned about low levels, that could turn out to be an issue down the road. For uh, California, again, as I mentioned, we have much better occurrence data. Um, here is a map of 75th percentile chrome 6 concentration. This is from the California Department of Public Health database that you can find online. Um, again, we still have the same definition for black, red, and green dots, but now we do have information in the 1 to 5 microgram per liter range, and you do see it scattered uh, throughout California. Um, so California stands to be impacted pretty greatly if indeed there is a uh, maximum contaminant level set down in this range here. So how are we going to get rid of hex chrome if we do uh, get an MCL? Uh, there are really four main technologies that have been looked at. Uh, reduction, coagulation, filtration, or RCF, um, which is primarily done with media filtration, but we do have a project that's testing it with microfiltration to get lower levels. Uh, anion exchange, which can be done with a weak base or a strong base resin, um, since it works for separating it uh, for analytical purposes, it works to remove it uh, from water as well. And then high pressure membrane filtration, either reverse osmosis or uh, nanofiltration. And again, we, most of this research was done by uh, Nicole Blute of Hazen and Sawyer, although other researchers have been involved as well. Um, so just a little bit of information about each of these technologies. Uh, the RCF process with media filtration, we've demonstrated it down to uh, its ability to get uh, hexavalent chromium out down to less than five micrograms per liter. Again, if you think about the public health goal of 20 um, or 0.02 microgram per liter, that's still uh, a good bit higher, but if you look at it in terms of the current MCL of 50, this is, this is really good, especially when you've got some levels coming in around 80. Um, and if you use the microfiltration, we're demonstrating it, or, or her research has demonstrated it to less than one microgram per liter. Uh, the benefit here is that you do get not only um, uh, hexavalent chromium, since you're reducing the hexchrome to trichrome, you're actually getting removal of total chromium. Uh, what they have found is uh, smaller filter pore size does improve removal, and that higher iron dose improves removal and may reduce uh, the reduction time. In terms of uh, oxidizing the ferrous that's used to uh, reduce the chromium, aeration and chlorine are both effective, but the kinetics are faster with chlorine. And to date, they really have not seen too much uh, oxidation when they use that chlorine. Um, however, the con here is that the residuals do require treatment and disposal, and depending on the water quality going in, they, it may be considered hazardous, so that can increase your costs in terms of uh, getting rid of it. Um, now, one of the two anion exchange processes is the weak base anion exchange. Uh, similarly, we've demonstrated this down to less than five micrograms per liter. Uh, again, it, you're reducing chrome 6 to chrome 3, and then you're incorporating it into the resin matrix. There are a couple of operational challenges. I don't know that I'll call them issues, but um, it does require pH adjustment, and that can be very costly when you're talking about um, wells that, that serve a large population. And right now, there's really only one uh, good proven resin, uh, so we, we need more resins to come on the market. Um, again, you have a residual issue. Some of the waste that's been generated to date is considered uh, T-norm, which means that it's uh, radioactive. 
and the one resin that is most proven does have some uh, formaldehyde when you first start up. So you, that's released when you first start up. So you do have to precondition the resin. Uh, the strong base anion exchange uh, mechanistically is very similar and its ability to remove uh, hex chrome is very similar. However, in this case, you can regenerate the resin with brine, so you're not having to dispose of the resin as often. However, uh, the brine does accumulate contaminants um, and itself re can require treatment and very costly disposal. So residuals is really something you'll see later. I think we need to do a lot more work on. Uh, high pressure membranes, I mentioned, is an option for treatment. We really do not have full scale demonstration of its ability to uh, remove hex chrome like we do with the other technologies. However, uh, we have information at bench scale and theoretically it should be able to remove it down to less than one microgram per liter. The only challenge, and I don't notice, note it here, is that um, you do then have to uh, condition the water after treatment with RO and some of the lime that is used for that has been found to have low levels of chromium in it. So that requires more research as well. And with any uh, high pressure membrane process you get water loss and concentrate uh, waste that again requires disposal. It can also be very expensive. So we, we've still got a lot of challenges here and oh, it looks like I lost my uh, some of the, the axes here on my graph, but um, uh, one of the challenges is the cost to treat. So this is an annualized cost in billions of years for the entire U.S. if uh, everyone that we know to have uh, hex chrome at certain levels, and since I don't have my axes, I'll tell you this is one, this is, uh, PPB, this is two, five, 10, and 20. And this is an annualized cost over 20 years, so this takes into account capital, which in most cases is about 50% of this cost, as well as these annual O&M costs, because as I mentioned before, especially these residuals, when you're having to dispose of them, that greatly increases your um, annual costs as well. Um, so this would not be a cheap regulation if we were to regulate uh, hex chrome at the national level. Even if you are out in the uh, 10 ppb range, this is very uh, similar and actually slightly higher than the arsenic MCL. So, um, and I should mention we have a range here because of the two different ways you can treat your residuals. You may be in an area where you are allowed to dispose of them or you may be in an area where you have to uh, treat them as hazardous waste and that can greatly impact the cost. Plus there were some other uncertainties that had to be taken into account in the uh, cost estimate that was done by our uh, project with Chad Seidel. Um, here is one for just California, and you'll actually see that uh, we're, we're actually looking a little bit higher than we were in the U.S. here um, because of, we have better data. So in this case, the uncertainty is really due to these residual scenarios um, and not so much the occurrence data. But again, we're talking about um, capital costs and billions of dollars, and then even over the 20 years, you're still looking at um, potentially half a billion, and that's at the 10 microgram per liter. So if you're talking about one microgram per liter, that you're, it's really going to be quite an impact to the state of California. Um, this is just a list of uh, all of the projects we've funded in really just the last two years on hexavalent chromium. What I tried to present to you today was the take-home messages from all of this work. Um, but uh, our utilities should be applauded, and not only have they asked us to do research on hex chrome, but many of them have brought their own money to the table uh, because they want to be prepared for any regulation and they are concerned about public health. Um, so I, I include these project numbers, which don't mean much to you, but I live and breathe these things. And if these slides are made available to you later, this is the easiest way to find any information on our website about a particular project is to use that project number. Um, the reason we funded most of these projects is we did a research planning exercise in 2011 uh, that generated this roadmap about all of the different um, knowledge gaps we identified. We have funded anything that uh, you see that's not in bold. We have funded ongoing projects on them and what we still think needs to be done to date are uh, looking at the contribution of corrosion, 
uh, minimizing those treatment residuals so that you, you can reduce the cost of disposal, and looking at some novel treatment options that hopefully could be lower cost than the ones that we know uh, today. A lot of our ongoing work is looking at how water quality impacts these treatment technologies because a lot of the work has been done at very limited number of utilities and we all know how water quality can impact um, whether it's a analytical method performance or treatment performance and actually today we had an RFP come out I don't know if any of you do um, uh, work that might look at possible um, oxidation of chrome 3 to chrome 6 from different disinfection scenarios so looking at um, different doses and applications of chlorine or chloramines um, to look at those uh, transitions in the distribution system but um, that's a new RFP that's out today that's got a pretty decent budget associated with it so we'll be paying attention to the results of that as it's generated and I just want to thank you for uh, listening today and uh, Hopefully, if I have time, open the floor for any questions. Thanks. Um, no, and I don't know why it would. You could, maybe if you're talking about, no, even advanced oxidation because then you're going to oxidize the chrome 3 to chrome 6. And um, there was a large project done in 2004 that at bench scale looked at many, many technologies. And any of the ones that showed any promise are the ones that we've done further research on to date. And so I'm not aware of any uh, work that's demonstrated UV. Uh, to have an ability to to treat hexchrome. Good question, though. Yes. Well, you might lose some of the uh, chromium that's absorbed onto iron particles, and Andy Eaton could probably tell us a lot more about that. Um, uh, so you, uh, and you don't want to lose that. You want to make sure that you're getting an accurate uh, number. Andy, anything you want to add to that? <laughs> it's the layman's answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, the, the filter I, I was talking about, that was part of the analytical method, so that's when you would use a filter like a, you know, 0.45 micron or something. So we were saying don't do that in, in that case. In the end, when I was talking about treatment, um, things like RO and, and NF have shown promise to uh, remove hex chrome. talks to have back to back, but, you know, it comes down to the balance between um, what I think everyone here is really interested in, which is, you know, analytical capabilities versus what the regulations are. And I'm in, you know, drinking water industry, so how our current technology can keep up with these regulations that are coming out, it's a really, you know, sometimes convoluted balance. And if you're looking at, you know, cost for treatment, having having to retrofit a drinking water treatment plant with reverse osmosis is extremely expensive. So, you know, getting this research to really understand what levels we need to be at, what makes sense, what protects public health coming out of the tap, you know, they're all extremely important issues. I agree. And, you know, you especially in today's environment, as Andy noted, where um, there's this perception that detection equals risk, and so you do have a lot of concerned citizens. You can find anything on the Internet. Um, we are getting numbers down to, to very low levels, and uh, in fact, I 
glossed right over it because I was looking at my time for the talk, but we, we do have a whole project looking at how to communicate risk and how to talk about hexavalent chromium, and we're hoping it'll be done before some of these UCMR3 numbers uh, come out. But, you know, anytime we hear, as much as, you know, as an organization we want to protect public health, um, we get nervous anytime we hear people asking, why don't we have a reg yet? If people are, are unprotected, we really do have to be careful with um, how we spend our money and making sure that if we're going to implement such extremely expensive treatment technologies that they are indeed worth it. There is a utility in California that did, um, California uh, Water Service Company that did an analysis of one of their small communities that only has about 1,500 people in it and what, it, uh, given the hex chrome levels that they have, um, if the regulation comes out around one microgram per liter, so again, far above the public health goal, their water bills are going to go from about 30 to $50 a month to about $150 a month. And these are people that can't afford to pay $150 a month. So then you have this whole water affordability issue as well. So, thank you. Right. Thank you, Alan.